Okay, welcome to our workshop. You're not in ESC land anymore. This workshop is designed to help you learn what is expected in real world work experiences. Then we spend so much time in school where students are supported and at work employees are expected to perform and will be compared to their typical counterparts. That's why we're not in ESC land anymore. So in this workshop today, we want to you know, understand first, why is this important? Why are we even talking about this um, employment and inclusion? for people with disabilities? Well, it's important because statistics show, for example, like in the 2019 US Bureau of Labor Statistics, only 19.3% of people with a disability are employed. And just this month in May uh, 2020, National Geographic, an article says eight out of 10 adults with autism are under or unemployed. So this is a real important topic and we're excited that you're joining us today. I'm going to introduce Brightfeeds and then we'll discuss workplace challenges, benefits of hiring someone with special needs, keys to success, resources, and we're going to share a little bit about our VIP Works employment programs. So first of all, the out outcomes for this workshop are for the applicant, is we want you to feel empowered to embrace challenges and to better articulate benefits of hiring someone with special needs. For employers, stakeholders, and teachers, we want you to understand the challenges that someone with special needs goes through and how to better support those individuals as we create an environment of inclusion in the workplace. So let me introduce um, us first. This workshop is presented by Brayfeeds. Brayfeeds helps families find educational, medical, and community resources. We publish a printed and website directory. You can go to brayfeeds.com to see electronic versions of our current publications, visit our website directory, view articles, our job board, summer programs, virtual resources, videos, and more. I'm Rory Becker. I'm the founder and owner of Brightfeeds. Being a parent of a medically complex child, I co-founded Brightfeeds 14 years ago to help families. As my daughter works toward independence, my focus and Brightfeeds focus has turned to providing strength-based employment. Our VIP Works Employment Training Program has attracted an incredible administrative team. They share my passion to provide meaningful employment to individuals with special needs and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi everybody, my name is Sarah Bravo and I work with Rory in the Orlando territory for Bright Feet. Um, my passion for working with people with special needs started with my nephew being diagnosed with autism. He actually just graduated high school last week. Um, this inspired me to become a special education teacher and I've taught in classrooms in Texas and Florida. Um, I've taught in a specialized behavior unit, self-contained autism classrooms, and eventually started working with the ASD Adult Achievement Center with young adults with autism. And that was how Rory and I became reconnected and eventually started working with Bright Beats. Hello everyone, I'm Phyllis Guffman, and I have been sharing disability information, resources, and communication for the special needs community for about 20 years. I founded Disability Resource Hub as a vehicle to disseminate resources, and I have been sharing it as the Tampa Bay Bright Feats directory for a few years. I met Rory about a decade ago, and I'm so fortunate that we stayed in touch so that I could um, partner with her and be a part of this great organization. Um, what led me into the field is my husband of 32 years, and I have two children, and our eldest son has autism. He's on the autism spectrum, 
And so I started working with Florida Diagnostic and Learning Resources System and other statewide organizations, including Arts for All Florida, which is the statewide organization on arts and disabilities, um, some nonprofit organizations and sports and recreation and special needs ministries and just a variety of organizations. But it's all come together now so that I can be part of the Bright Feeds family and I'm so happy to be a part of the team. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Yerby. I am the parent of a 21 year old son with primarily nonverbal autism. And I've uh, started in the Florida area. I moved here about 14 years ago and I started the Angels Bridge and Gap Autism Support Group, an organization which we ran as a ministry of the First Baptist Church of Malabar. In doing so, I got very involved with a number of organizations, um, the Interagency Council of Brevard, um, which I've served as chair, and I continued to work um, tirelessly to help educate families about resources and information, and in terms of providing parent meetings and church um, uh, opportunities for engagement and socialization. So we also do a, um, once a month, we did a horseback riding program in addition to a bowling program with our family here in Brevard County. And I had the pleasure of meeting Rory a number of years ago and inviting her to come out and participate with us. And from there, we kind of partnered up. So we've been partnered up a little bit over five and a half years now. And Bright Feet has turned out to be an amazing organization and I'm so glad to be a part of this team. Um, our dedication truly is helping um, our communities in terms of our families finding resource information and also um, providing our community partners with those supports to help them grow their businesses and help educate our families and community. And most importantly, our, our, education, our VIP work program, which uh, allows us to provide training for our individuals and opportunities. So again, I wanna thank our Bright Beats team for everything that we do and um, I look forward to continue this journey with us. So some of the challenges that people with autism face in the workplace are social anxiety, severe sensory challenges, inflexibility, difficulty handling criticism, unwillingness to share or collaborate. So with social anxiety, I think the one thing to note when trying to overcome social anxiety is that there's a difference between social potential and social performance, and that key is context. Um, there's a great book by Peter Vermeulen called Autism is Context Blindness, and these are some of the topics that he covers in the book. If I were to ask you, what is a nice birthday present for a good friend? you would realize there's not a one-size-fits-all answer, but rather the situation depends. Is this a good friend? Is this someone you haven't talked to in a while? Um, what's your budget? <laughs> what are their likes and dislikes? Um, it really varies from person to person. And our brain interprets situations based on context. However, the autistic brain thinks in absolutes rather than rel a relative contextually defined way. So how do we go about teaching contextual sensitivity? Instead of focusing on social skills, we should focus on teaching social contexts and then teach the necessary rules, conversations, and behaviors attached to a certain context. And this can apply to the workplace. And this would be a good way to overcome that social anxiety in the workplace. So when entering the workplace, what is the routine? When you walk in, you clock in, are you allowed to converse with your coworkers? What is an appropriate amount of time to converse? What are socially appropriate topics to converse about? And then you can apply this to other contexts as well. For example, if you're visiting a friend in the hospital, what is an appropriate present to bring? How long should you stay? What you should and shouldn't say? And what are topics that you can talk about? Other challenges that you may face in the workplace are sensory challenges. And right now, I feel like there's going to be a shift to working from home, um, more remote work and allowing for telecommuting. 
and a lot of the work from home physicians will uh, be able to alleviate a lot of these sensory challenges. However, if you do find yourself in the workplace or in a work environment, there's some sensory challenges you may face, including fragrance sensitivity, light sensitivity, noise sensitivity, and temperature sensitivity. For fragrance sensitivity, I would request from the manager that I would be able to bring my own air purifier or be able to take fresh air breaks. Um, if you have a light sensitivity, requesting to be in a dimmer area, or if you wear glasses, um, wearing transition lenses that dim whenever you're in bright lights. For temperature sensitivity, um, it's important to dress in layers so that you're able to change. If you're too hot, you can take off some layers like a light sweater. Um, and if you're cold, you can put on a light sweater. And for noise sensitivity, noise canceling headphones are great. Um, you can get a lot of them for relatively uh, cheap. And if noise canceling headphones don't work, you can ask if your manager would mind that you brought a white noise machine. So another challenge that people with autism face is inflexibility of thinking. And I read an article by a young lady with autism and it really stuck out to me what she said. Her starters, um, she said, for an autistic person, the thoughts are pictures in your brain. So a lot of that inflexibility comes from being resistant to changing something that may seem minor to a lot of people. But what's important to note is that you don't have to tear down your whole picture. Think of your picture in layers. Um, so think of clear projector sheets. And these are all different layers and you're able to change out certain layers, but the big picture stays the same. So for example, if you go to a meeting at the office and you see someone else is in the chair that you always sit in, we can think about the big picture item and see that big picture in different layers. And let's take out that seating layer and let's just put yourself in another seat and put that slide back in and the big picture stays the same. The only thing that's changed is that you are now sitting in a different seat. Um, wow, that's some really great information. Thanks so much, Sarah. I'm going to talk about some additional challenges in the workplace. They have to do with criticism and feedback, which can also be criticism or praise. One of the things to think about when it comes to feedback and specifically criticism is that you have to identify which comments are useful and use those comments for self-improvement. So how to handle criticism. The first thing is to see it as an opportunity for growth. You have to remove your ego. You know, don't take it personally. You have to extract the meaning from what someone's saying and then focus on how can you improve yourself and make things better. One of the first things you should do is just pause and take a moment, absorb, hear, listen and understand what someone else is telling you. Feedback is a real opportunity to grow. Another thing to do is to understand who's providing the feedback. You have to clarify with that person and determine a plan of action. Another key component to criticism is developing a thick skin. You have to remember in the workplace especially, there's always going to be room for improvement. Um, you can always make things better and that's especially true for things that are of a creative nature. For instance, when we produce our publications, Everything in our offices, all of our interns, all of our participants, our employees will stop and help proofread because no matter how many times you look at the publication, we can always find things to improve. Another thing is to, to consider with criticism is to bounce back. You have to embrace your feedback and move forward and also develop your ability to give really good peer feedback as well. Your employer is going to appreciate that a lot. So another part of feedback is praise, and specifically how to handle praise. One thing you have to consider is who is saying it and why. 
Is it a client, a coworker, or a boss? You have to um, really analyze what's, what's the reasoning behind the feedback that you're getting. Understand why you're being praised and what specifically they liked so that you can duplicate that in the future. Another good suggestion when it comes to praise is to learn and document your strengths. Uh, you can keep a, a journal to take, keep track of your praise. And then later when you're feeling down about work, you could go back and refer to all these wonderful things that people have told you about your work. And then refer to that in the future when you're um, handling some situations at work. Another challenge at work is unwillingness to share or collaborate. And that really involves teamwork. And what is a team? A team is a group of people working together for a common goal. In this case, it would be work success. It's really important to work as a part of a team at your work site. Employers are really looking for that in employees. They want workers who can contribute, who can work well with others, and create a pleasant environment. Some of the ways to do that would be to contribute, communicate, you know, make sure you're sharing at work and talking to other people in appropriate ways. Take responsibility for yourself and respect others and above all, participate. You really have to understand your strengths in order to know where you can participate and best serve as part of the team. Learn how you can contribute. Some of the common challenges when it comes to teamwork include not participating. It's, it's really common for individuals with special needs to have additional challenges to make it to work and perform. But that is so important. We need employees who can participate fully. Another challenge is inconsistency. Employers need 100% of the work completed. Um, in my experience working with individuals with special needs, they perform sometimes really well with an activity and then at other times that they're having a bad day or something, they're not performing as well. And employers really need 100% of that work done and they need it done well. So that's really important, being consistent. Another thing, um, another challenge in relationship to working in a team would be complaints. Um, sometimes, you know, we're all getting paid for work. That's why the people pay you to do the job because um, it's, you know, if you had anything to do in life, you'd probably be out, you know, enjoying uh, great outdoors or something. But um, in reality, work is work. Um, sometimes, you know, it might be a little repetitive and a little bit boring. Other times it's gonna be easier. Sometimes it might be super challenging. But it's important um, that employers can give you um, a variety of work and that you're willing to pitch in to help get whatever needs to be done completed. So those are some of the additional challenges um, in the workplace. First of all, the opportunity is great. I love the hard and soft skills. It really basically lets you learn everything you need to know. And overall, it's just really set me up for success. It means a lot to me. I got to know everyone here really good. Yeah. And I'm getting along with them really well.
All right, now one of the things that we're gonna talk about right now are some of the benefits of hiring someone with autism. As we know, statistics say that individuals with autism um, are underemployed by 90%. So this is definitely a challenging population to employ, but such a rewarding population to employ at the same time. Um, it's important to focus on their strengths. It's important to focus on the things that they can accomplish. And they have, like I said, some wonderful skills. Um, great attention to detail, thoroughness, accuracy, um, deep focus. Um, when they really like a particular activity and you focus on something that they really feel passionate about, you're gonna get the most out of them because they're extremely tenacious in terms of uh, following through on things that, again, that they're very interested in or things that may, um, once you show them once how to do a particular activity, again, they're gonna perform that activity over and over again tirelessly, um, unlike some of their counterparts who may get a little bored with that particular activity. Um, a lot of times with people with disabilities, um, they don't get the same opportunities to participate in the um, employment pool and the job opportunities that others get. And when they get those opportunities, they truly um, are very um, appreciative and they show that through their hard work. Um, their creativity is unbeknownst. Um, again, some of the greatest minds um, known to, to um, uh, Mozart and different individuals um, have great capacity for creativity. Um, we are finding that a lot of companies now are starting to look for individuals with disabilities and with autism in particular because of the way their minds work. Um, I had the pleasure of working with a small group of young adults recently and we were working with one of our clients to create a logo for them, specifically about autism. And the conversation was extremely robust. It actually had to do with our peer review, which we do within our VIP Works program. And it was wonderful to see how they um, were able to talk with each other and intertwine and, and kind of come up with other suggestions and concrete suggestions as to um, the logo and what would look good and why it looked good. So again, don't underestimate our individuals with disabilities and with autism and, and various disabilities, because again, this can be an extremely wonderful work pool. Um, they have great expertise in a lot of areas. I've been had the privilege in when I worked in data management to work with a number of individuals with autism within my data management department. Um, so again, there's some serious areas that they have um, great capacity for, um, technology for one, um, and a number of other areas as well. Um, great writers, um, even Rory's daughter, who's hoping to be a future writer. Um, I think that's going to be an, a wonderful area for her because it's something that she's interested in. So again, um, just know that our individuals with disabilities have some wonderful skills, and also with companies and organizations, um, they're also going to get some great benefits, too, in terms of tax benefits, um, increased diversity within their job pool. Um, they're going to increase staff morale because people are going to feel good about being able to extend themselves to help someone else that maybe does need that extra help sometimes. Um, but at the same time, again, it's making the company and the organization feel like they're really digging into some of our social um, needs. And one of those for sure is definitely supporting our disability community. Really cuts off the last two areas of that number. I have no idea. Um, I mean, I think we tried the. Yeah, I think one of these. Okay, cuts off. It says ordinary sports for extraordinary, and then cuts off with the last couple letters of people. Everything I get to do, uh, all the opportunities I have to appear at Bright Feats and, uh, you know, getting to design, which is something I really love to do, most of all. Well, this program has essentially kind of helped me figure out, like, what you need to do in order to properly interact and work in a more professional environment. And definitely it's been helpful with all of the different programs and different systems that we've been working with. This program has meant very much to me. It actually gave me an opportunity to actually work with more people within my field as well as actually develop my skills as a potential video editor and to have pursue a career to actually get into filmmaking. So.
Well, this program meant that it's a place where I can gain experience and I can use as a stepping stone other places. Hello, now we're going to focus on some keys to success, starting with motivation and interest. Reports of parents or teachers sometimes show that individuals with intellectual disabilities appear to have deficits in motivation. However, adults with intellectual disabilities describe self-determination as being able to say what they want or do not want to make their intentions heard, and to make and act on decisions. Additionally, many studies have found that people with intellectual disabilities want to work in the community. Determining interest may lead to motivation. So ongoing investigation and observation over time may be required to identify those interests. I'm gonna share a story about a young man that was a transition student that was having quite a bit of academic challenges. When I asked the mother what he liked to do at home, what he was interested in, she said, well, he's not really interested in anything. He doesn't seem to be motivated at home either. And I said, well, can you tell me a story about something that was surprising to you that he did? And she said, oh yeah, there was this one thing my husband was mowing the lawn and the lawnmower broke down and he got frustrated and came in the house and my son took apart the lawnmower, identified what was wrong with it, fixed it, and put it back together. The father had come back out and observed that. I thought it was kind of interesting that she didn't feel that that was a strength, but we were able to um, focus on that and realize that he had um, quite a few strengths that could be used in academic pursuits um, as well as in employment. I mean, he understood machinery and problem solving and a host of other skills. So this leads us to flexibility. As Sarah mentioned earlier, there may be a resistance to change. Um, one key could be to focus on choice. If being flexible is a challenge, incorporate opportunities to change things up on a regular basis across settings, such as at home, school, and other programs. Um, use tools that can help you, such as timers to assist, and positive reinforcers when goals are achieved. Implementing choices and options when appropriate, such as offering a non-preferred task and then a preferred task. This allows the individual to try out a range of options and experiences to encourage choice, even if it's not that apparent that it's there for them. Now, support from parents and guardians is crucial to help individuals and family members face fears and legitimate concerns about safety, transportation, work hours, disability benefits, social environment, and work skill issues. These are important concerns, but they should not block people from real life in the community. It is important to help individuals identify the supports they need so they can live the life they want. And you can help an individual with disabilities develop a life vision and long-term goals with strategies that we will discuss very soon. Self-awareness and reality of actual skill set is important for all individuals regardless of ability. Encourage individuals to embrace their strengths because after all, that's the only thing you can build on. You can't build on deficits. You can also encourage them to identify their challenges so that they have some learning opportunities that they can focus on in those areas. I worked with a family that had a transition age student 
who was determined to be a veterinarian. We, did, we focused on the elements she liked about that profession. She liked visiting the office. She liked that her dogs felt better after a visit. She just liked animals in general. And armed with this knowledge, we were able to, to discover many opportunities that could prepare her for working with animals, such as pet shops, the zoo, the aquarium, shelters, even pet sitting or pet walking. And eventually she was able to work as a volunteer at one of her favorite places, the vet office. So maybe being a doctor wasn't in her future, but she certainly found lots of options where she could work with animals, which is really what she wanted to do. That was the actual core of her desire. Now remember to utilize your resources. Achieving desired outcomes may require planning. In fact, it will likely require lots of planning and the sooner you start, the better. You could collaborate with the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities, teachers, transition specialists, voc rehab staff, and other professionals. And now we're gonna close in with a powerful strategy. It's called person-centered planning. It is an ongoing problem-solving process used to help people with disabilities plan for their future. In person-centered planning, groups of people focus on an an individual and that person's vision of what they would like to do in the future. The groups of people are comprised of stakeholders such as parents, um, caregivers, guardians, friends, teachers, program folks, doctors even, therapists, whoever is a stakeholder that is really concerned. They create a person-centered team and they meet to identify opportunities for the individual to develop personal relationships, participate in their community, increase control over their own lives, and develop the skills and the abilities needed to achieve those goals. Now, you can find a lot about person-centered planning, um, as well as um, some of the other things that I spoke about earlier at inclusion.com. It gives you lots of different types of person-centered planning, including maps and paths, and how you go about reaching that bright North Star. And there's also a circle of friends. So you can find them all at that website. You can also find a lot about um, the other keys at partnerships and employment. And those links will be provided for you at the conclusion of our presentation. Thank you. Uh, this program meant a lot to me because it offered me uh, not only a job, but I got to learn a lot of skills that I wouldn't otherwise get to learn.
something, right? Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about resources. Um, as you know, Break Creek, one of the reasons that we actually came together was to provide resources to our families and information about resources throughout different parts of Florida. Um, and we know that this is a key factor in the success of our individuals um, and making sure that they have the right support around them. Um, again, Bright Feats is going to be one of your resource uh, connections, um, www.brightfeats.com. Um, we also have publications that come out as well with great articles and information and other things that we put on the website. Um, we have the Family Path, which is an amazing event. Um, and then we're glad to be a part of this event that's going on right now. Um, I had the pleasure of going a few years ago. That's actually how I first became acquainted with Great Feet and Rory was probably about 10, 14, 12 years ago or so. Um, I went to a family calf event um, to get resource information for Bavard County and actually met either Rory or one of her, someone that was working at her table at the time. And I remember holding on to this little tiny magazine with all this wonderful information and taking that with me. Um, and I always tell all my community partners, if you've never been to a family calf event, make sure you get to go. It's a great place where all the different agencies collaborate and come together um, and provide awesome information for our families and um, a lot of great collaboration also um, takes part at that event as well. Um, we have vocational uh, rehabilitation, which is the agency here in, the, in, the, in Florida that helps provide resource information um, and uh, direction for individuals with disabilities. Um, we are exists in a number of different places um, in, uh, in different areas. Um, through your schools, you'll be able to get in contact with your rehabilitation coordinators um, who are usually attached to the various schools and your transitional program. So definitely reach out to them and get as much information as possible. Get involved as early as possible. Um, I think one of my partners mentioned that. Um, by age 14, you definitely want to get your individual with a disability um, registered and get involved in some of those great summer programs that exist. I know this summer is a little bit of a challenge for a number of our families and for our VR counselors, but there are some programs that are going on, so definitely reach out to them. Um, we have the Family Care Council. Again, that's a wonderful organization, again, providing information to families. And um, they're here in a number of parts of Florida. They extend to other surrounding areas as well. And then we also have SIL, which is going to be the Center for Independent Living, um, another great organization. There's also going to be a lot of local resources in the area. Um, like I said, I'm all the way over in Brevard. Um, Phyllis is all the way in Tampa and Rory and um, Sarah are in the greater Orlando area. But one of the key components is making sure to get in touch with some of the important organizations and agencies, Agency for Persons with Disabilities, all these various organizations that can help provide those support to that individual and also make sure that um, that, that uh, uh, path or plan for the future is actually in place and that everyone knows what those resources are. Because one of the key things that's important for the success of this individual is to make sure that everyone that's part of the plan knows what those steps are gonna be. All right, we're going to move on now to our next slide. We're going to go into the VIP work program. Rory's going to take care of that. Hey, thanks, Jackie. And so I want to let you know a little bit about VIP Works, which is Bright Feet's employment training program. At VIP Works, we train individuals with autism and other special needs to do the work that we do at Bright Feet's. We collaborate with our community partners to make this happen. Our community partners include the ASD Adult Achievement Center in Altamont Springs. The ASD Adult Achievement Center um, is our print and digital production site. Yep, there we go. <laughs> Here participants mm -hmm. design graphics for our publications and participating providers. They design videos to promote providers and manage our extensive website. Another community partner is the McDonald Training Center in Tampa. The McDonald Training Center serves as our digital marketing and social media hub. Participants there learn about creating social media posts and email marketing. 
And then our third community partner is the Brevard Achievement Center in Rockledge. The Brevard Achievement Center helps with our data entry activities and confirms accuracy of our ever expanding directory. So we hope that you've enjoyed our workshop today. We've talked about the challenges in the workplace, benefits of hiring someone with special needs, We've reviewed the keys to success. We shared common resources and highlighted details about our VIP Works program. We hope that you are empowered to embrace challenges and will share in our mission to increase inclusion in the workplace and help more people experience meaningful long-term employment. Here are some resources um, for you to review that we've discussed during the program. Thanks so much for joining us and um, thanks so much, you know, our Brightface team for presenting this really great information. Good job.